Thousands of years ago, a great work was begun on a barren landscape. The people behind the project erected a ring of colossal stones according to precise calculations. When the job was finished, a complex machine stood in the middle of no place. Then, they disappeared. But their monument is almost intact. It is called Stonehenge. The glow of ancient knowledge has faded, but a strange power still seems to linger over the stones. It beckons some men to worship, others to search for the magic of Stonehenge. Architects are unknown. Their purpose has been forgotten. But for many, the magic of Stonehenge is still fresh. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. It is among the classic mysteries of the world, an immense circle of stones that stands on the Salisbury Plain in southern England. For centuries, men have called it Stonehenge and wondered at its purpose. The mystery of Stonehenge is twofold. Who built it and why? Archaeologists normally have the answer to one of those questions and can deduce the rest. But until now, we've known very little about Stonehenge and understood less. Only recently has evidence come to light that points to Stonehenge being an exceedingly complex machine, yet with a purpose so simple it was overlooked for centuries. But finding the why of Stonehenge only increases the mystery of who built it. Stonehenge is a puzzle that seems to defy the usual methods of archaeology. There are no written clues to explain it. Theories that it was a city of the dead or a pagan temple of sacrifice have been based as much on pure speculation as on evidence. The first breakthrough in understanding came in the mid-1960s when a young astronomer entered the search. It was a solution based on pure numbers and pure directions. And His name is Gerald Hawkins, author of Beyond Stonehenge. And strangely, it did require uh, a new look. It required perhaps an astronomer to look at it, as I did. And just looking through the archways, I felt that it must be more than a temple. Uh, the idea of doors in an open plain uh, didn't make sense to me, and uh, I felt I should see something through these archways. So began the quest for a solution to the riddle of Stonehenge. Hawkins began by investigating the few known facts. The earliest uh, holes in the ground uh, seem to date now to 2500, 2700 BC. Roughly the time of the Egyptian pyramids, maybe a few centuries ahead. Uh, then the Stonehenge proper was built, approximately 2000 BC. Uh, they were working there for centuries, perhaps even a thousand years. The world at 2500 BC was dotted by no more than a handful of civilizations. Much of the world's population lived in caves was learning how to forge crude tools out of bronze. In Egypt, the slaves were still toiling over the Great Pyramids. The walls of Jericho were yet unbreached. In Mesopotamia, the Sumerians were just beginning to use a new tool called writing to record their history and legends. It would be centuries before the Jews would hide the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran. From the tiny island of Crete, 
the Minoan Empire ruled the Mediterranean world. Their ancient sea kings had not yet sailed their ships beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. No explorer had touched the shore of North America, crossed its wide expanses, or glimpsed any of its wonders. Yet in that remote time, an army of men was mobilized on the Salisbury Plain to build Stonehenge. Why? At one time, the suggestion was the stones came down by glaciers, but uh, it seems that the stone was indeed quarried. Uh, we have pretty well proof that it was quarried because uh, recently uh, museum uh, replicas went there and found a stone with an actual drill hole. Uh, we have a sample of it here. It was cut into and shows the two halves. This stone is so tough it takes half an hour to cut with a diamond saw yet they drilled in with no equipment except perhaps some flint chips and a piece of wood. Why did the ancient engineers select blue stones that can be found in only one place in the world, the Presley Mountains? Rocks so hard, they dull modern cutting tools. This is one of the inner circle of blue stones which geologists have found were brought all the way from the Preseli Mountains in Wales. And it does seem that there is really only one place in the world where they could have come from. But there is also a theory that... Another investigator, Francis Hitching, has been probing the legends of Stonehenge, groping for a key to unlock its mystery. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, the main one being, why on earth did they bother to put up these as opposed to those? What special kind of power did these stones contain? Hitching believes that for the ancient Britons, the countryside was alive with supernatural spirits, and that even the rocks were endowed with magical powers. Local folklore is rich with tales like that of the Devil's Heel. It is said that the devil stalked the woods one night and left his mark in stone. According to another legend, nine maidens were frozen into stone when the morning light caught them frolicking on the moors. Other rocks were thought to dance on midsummer's morn. It was a matter of firm belief that evil spirits presided over certain boulders like the hunchback gnome that lurked under a roof of stone. Or the witch who cast a spell over tingle stone, making it unsafe to touch after dark. Positive powers were attributed to other monoliths, like the one called Stanton Drew, which could supposedly cure a sick child of the pox. Or the fairy stone, which was believed to emit a strange energy, like an electrical charge. What all these legends add up to, it seems to me, is that a certain kind of power existed in them and was known to the people at that time. And as recently as a couple of years ago, there were reports of witchcraft ceremonies taking place in a series of stones called the Rollright Stones in the Midlands. From the Presley Mountains, where the Stonehenge rocks were quarried, they were hauled some 240 miles across the landscape of England. No powered vehicles existed. Forests and narrow streams clotted the path between the quarry and the final site. How were the stones moved? In 1954, the British Broadcasting Company recruited 40 schoolboys to retrace the steps their ancestors might have taken. The purpose of the experiment was to determine the likely methods used to transport the stones. A concrete slab, only one-fiftieth the weight of a bluestone, was used. Nothing like this astonishing feat of transportation was ever attempted by any other people in prehistoric Europe. Their task was so arduous that later generations believed the builders must have been aided by the magician Merlin. According to legend, 
Merlin made the stones so light that they could float on water. But there were still casualties along the way. If magic is excluded as a source of power for the Stonehengers, then most of the population of southern Britain must have been involved in hauling the stones to Salisbury. We're speaking very uh, glibly about it. I estimate one and a half million man days of work and uh, many uh, broken legs and so on. Uh, a drive, an effort, an achievement that um, they got a great satisfaction out of. Uh, as to what was in their minds. Uh, at least I have uncovered certain very hard facts, numerical relationships, an interest in precision, an interest in time patterns, and uh, this means something very fundamental to their psychological basis and to their beliefs. What they were doing was a complete entity to them. It must have been extremely satisfying. They did not do it by uh, being driven as slaves. They did not do it for money because there was no monetary system. They did it because they wanted to. And here we have perhaps uh, the beginning of uh, our civilization, the essence of civilization, a community with a common purpose and a common set of ideas. Surely the masterminds of Stonehenge could not have inspired an army of workers unless the people were held in the spell of a great, perhaps even magical idea. A religious sect called Druids claims spiritual descent from the architects of Stonehenge. There is little evidence to support their claim. Their ritual reenactments on the site are of little help in solving the puzzle, for the Druids were apparently latecomers. The people who put up Stonehenge came from a time before people could read and write, and really this is one of the big mysteries about Stonehenge. How they came later on to have a mathematical, geometrical, astronomical knowledge which seems quite beyond the conceptions of primitive and barbarian people. But perhaps more remarkable than that is the fact that scattered all over Britain are some 300 other circles, some of them still intact, which can do the same job. And the man who has discovered this spent half a lifetime doing it is Professor Alexander Tom. An engineer by training, Tom was convinced that there was a calculated design behind what appeared to be a random arrangement of stones. Using advanced mathematics, Tom was able to prove that the stones were aligned both to one another and to the movement of the planets in the night sky. The implications of his discovery are staggering. It now seems possible that the whole of prehistoric Britain was landscaped according to a deliberate and far-reaching plan. There are a number of theories as to whether there is any reality to legends about the magic power of megaliths. And perhaps the one which has been most widely written about is that the whole of Britain is crisscrossed with a network of invisible straight lines called ley lines. These are supposed to link all ancient sacred sites like some unimaginably complicated spider's web. And the stones, all the sites, burial mounds, tombs, they're supposed to have been put on certain key places which were chosen because they had some kind of power. Fortresses were built atop sacred mounds, as if to absorb the power of old ruins. And monks erected churches on sites where pagan priests once gathered to recite magical incantations. In folklore, some key sites retained their magic long after the builders disappeared. It is known that around some of these sites, Underneath the tombs, around the standing stones, there are anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field. And here, I think, may lie the secret to the power in these megaliths. If Francis Hitching's theory is correct, 
what prehistoric man called magic may have been akin to 20th century electromagnetic energy. Is it just possible that people in those times somehow knew how to tap the electromagnetic anomalies that are in these stones and use them in their healing? Is it perhaps also possible that they used it, as birds do and as dogs seem to, in telepathy? They could find their way by these stones. They could perhaps communicate from one stone to another. They were like a giant psychic grid which could be used for telepathic purposes. Like the animals of the forest, the inhabitants of prehistoric Britain may have been attuned to the Earth's signals. Some have theorized that electromagnetic energy may be the basis of extrasensory perception. If this is true, perhaps the Stonehengers used that psychic energy on a level never achieved since. At the very center of this hypothetical communications network stood Stonehenge. As a quantitative scientist, I saw a fundamental pattern that intrigued me and reached my brain and mind. Uh, and so, with calculations, I was able to go back in time to 2000 BC and, uh, as though it were, stand there and watch the sunrise and moonrise and planets and stars. And with the computer, uh, very quickly, uh, we could see that the pattern of stones matched the pattern of the sky. Therefore, a ritualistic temple became a much more fundamental device. It had at least some purpose, and that purpose reached out to the stars. With the aid of a computer, Dr. Gerald Hawkins was able to do what no man before him had done, prove that Stonehenge was in part a calendar and an observatory. Each giant block points to a specific position of a planet or star as it moves in its journey across the heavens. In such a way, sky and earth were inextricably bound through a Stone Age machine. The most celebrated alignment is the heel stone that points to the rising sun on midsummer's morn. The popular assumption is that the Druids used the site for rituals of incantation and human sacrifice. But were they the designers of Stonehenge? Archaeologists and antiquarians have argued for centuries about who put up this great erection of stones here. The best bet seemed to be the Druids, because the Druids uh, were known to have existed here in Britain before Caesar arrived. In fact, Caesar described the Druids. So 18th century antiquarians, such as William Stukeley, used to draw fanciful pictures of the Druids as they thought taking part in ceremonies around Stonehenge and similar kinds of circles. Now we're almost certain today that this conception is absolutely wrong and the kind of people who you see taking part in Druid ceremonies here on Midsummer Morning are nothing more than a 19th century invention. Druids, in fact, what we do know about them they had a strong priestly class who used to gather on the whole in oak groves where their secret ceremonies took place. They were a bloodthirsty uh, race. Caesar describes them as hanging people up in baskets and burning them. Otherwise, we know that they were indeed expert astronomers. If, as Hitching and other investigators have concluded, the architects of Stonehenge were not the Druids, then who did design and build it? Far from being mere hunters or cave dwellers, the prehistoric Stonehengers seem suddenly to have become possessed of a superior, highly sophisticated intelligence. Otherwise, they could never have devoted their total energies to a grid that covered all England and focused on the axis of Stonehenge. One must wonder, from where did they get this incredible spurt of knowledge? a spurt that was 5,000 years ahead of its time. The answer may never be known, but the stones still have a power for many who worship in the manner of the Druids. And Stonehenge still intrigues men who seek to understand the workings of an ancient machine. I wonder if they were not worshipping a new type of god to us, a god of time. Uh, the idea just comes to me now that perhaps uh, the repetitive uh, security of time, following time, was of value to them. And perhaps even Stonehenge itself was built 
to uh, perhaps defeat the ravages of time in that time had a concept to them. If ever we can find out uh, an idea that explains what they did, it will be really dramatic. I don't feel that we've come close to any idea yet, but can, you can imagine a god of time. We don't have it. We hate time, but maybe they look forward to it. What were the Stonehenges looking forward to? Was it merely the observations of the cycles of time or the predictions of eclipses? Or did they expect some even more magical communication from the outer cosmos, where time has no limits? Stonehenge is not alone as a riddle of ancient design. In the thick jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula, an ancient observatory called the Caracol charted the phases of Venus as accurately as 20th century telescopes. Buried deep within the same jungle, a Mayan pyramid was aligned to the midsummer sun. 6,000 miles away, Egyptian pyramids mapped the rising and the setting sun on the same day. In the distant past of India, holy men gathered to watch the sky. For what were they waiting? We have some understanding now of the possible explanation for Stonehenge and the other monuments around the world that have puzzled investigators for so long. The question which still eludes us is who erected these working monuments? Clearly, they were the work of people more advanced than we had thought possible for that time. We can speculate that our ancestors were possessed of knowledge that was somehow lost to succeeding generations. Or perhaps they had help. <laughs> 